key for sodium intake with the water to expand plasma volume and to avoid that excess osmotic dilution that I just talked about. On top of all of that, there are also cues that actually come from the mouth and the throat when you drink. Those are called oropharyngeal stimulation, and one that is called oropharyngeal metering. So the actual act of fluid in your mouth and going down your throat affects thirst, as does the act of swallowing and other signals in the GI system. So you have all these different things going on. And I'm going to convince you that the thirst mechanism or the sense of thirst in magnitude in the elderly is attenuated compared to younger individuals, then the big question tends to be why? Which or are all of these things different as we age? In general, as Stavros and others have, have talked about, in young healthy adults, the sense of thirst always lags behind fluid needs. So as plasma osmolality increases, as we become dehydrated, plasma ADH, antidiuretic hormone, for example, starts to go up right away. So if there's a threshold that's much higher with respect to plasma osmolality beyond which thirst increases. And that thirst threshold tends to allow us to become dehydrated well before the sense of thirst kicks in. So in laboratory studies, how do you study these things? Well, there are various experimental techniques we can use to stimulate thirst. We can just have people not drink for a while, fluid restriction, 18 hours, 24 hours. We can have them exercise, especially in the heat where they lose a lot of sweat. We can do passive heating, where we just have them sit in a hot room or artificially heat them up. All of those things increase osmolality and decrease volume. So those are kind of natural forms of dehydration. We also can infuse saline that has a high salt concentration into their veins. And when you do that, you get that osmol drive to thirst for thirst, but volume is actually increased rather than decreased. And when we heat acclimate people, both of those things go up as well because they expand their plasma volume. There are also experimental techniques to turn off thirst or to stimulate satiety. So we can load fluid, we can give people an IV, for example, that increases their volume but tends to dilute their osmols. And an interesting <coughs> technique used in a lot of exercise physiology laboratories is head out immersion have people sit in a tank of water up to the level of about their sternum. What that does is the hydrostatic pressure tends to force blood volume centrally that corrects this volume problem but doesn't, have, doesn't do anything else to the osmolar drive to, to drink. So Nina Stackenfeld in the late 1990s at Yale did a really neat series of studies where she took young subjects, 24-year-old men, and she had them dehydrate by coming in after an overnight fast and then exercising in the heat, 36 degrees C, which is about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. They had a baseline thirst before they came in. After they were dehydrated, their thirst rating went up significantly. But then when she put them in to a tank of water with head out immersion, because the volume signal was corrected, their thirst rating went down. She did the same thing in a group of 70-year-old men. Baseline was the same. They were less thirsty after dehydration and putting them in a tank and correcting the blood volume problem did nothing to their thirst. In both groups, importantly, thirst dictated how much they drank because of 
thermos doesn't dictate how much you drink, then there may be some processing issues as well. To show that rats are good models for studying humans and to do studies we've already done in humans and rats, I'll show you some animal data. In this group of rats, they gave the drug minoxidil, which is a blood pressure lowering drug. And they did one, two, three, four levels of dehydration, or sorry, four levels of the drug. These squares are the oldest rats, the circles are the youngest rats, and the triangles are the middle group of rats. And you can see here, this dose of drug, here's their blood pressure. They gave a dose of the drug that lowered the blood pressure, lowered it even more, and then gave a really high dose to lower blood pressure. Nothing else is done to these rats, just lowering their blood pressure. And if you look at their water intake, lowering the blood pressure causes thirst and causes an increase in fluid intake. And you can see here that the youngest rats have the greatest and most rapid response to increasing their fluid intake in light of a falling blood volume. The oldest rats, shown here, have a delayed response and a really attenuated response. So the bottom line is that age-related declines in thirst and fluid intake are more responsive to low blood volume or hypotension than changes in cellular dehydration. So the common theory now is that the thirst deficiency in the elderly, and we're talking again about this short-term transient response. You become dehydrated because you've exercised, because you've had an overnight fast, because you've been sitting in a hot environment, is due to a reduced ability to sense a volume deficit. It's a problem of the aging cardiovascular system, not the brain's inability to sense changes in osmolality. So during normally occurring dehydration, osmolality increases in the blood, but blood volume decreases. Young adults are thirstier at a given osmolality because the blood volume decrease is sensed appropriately, whereas in the older individuals, they have trouble sensing blood volume and sending a signal back to the brain that causes thirst. So if you take a microcosm of what I showed you as daily fluid intake before, again, fluid in and fluid out, if you have a young subject drink some fluid, water or Gatorade, and then exercise, immediately after exercise, they're thirsty, they drink, and very quickly thereafter, they urinate out what they just drank. In older adults, doing a similar amount of exercise, shown in green here, that total rehydration occurs eventually. It just takes a lot longer. So instead of these big drinking binges early and getting rid of it in the elderly, they're not as thirsty because they've lost volume. It takes them much longer to dehydrate. And it's that period of time that may leave them vulnerable to certain other environmental problems. And then it takes them longer to get rid of the fluid as well. That's the big difference. There are some new studies just now using PET scans of the brain. There are areas of the brain that light up when people are thirsty. There are areas of the brain that light up in a PET scanner when people feel satiety or the cessation of thirst. And in one of those studies, they infused hypertonic saline, again, that doesn't result in a loss of volume, but changes the osmolality and makes you thirsty. When they did that, in a group of younger and older men, the younger guys were uh, 24 years of age, the older men were 68 years of age. <clears throat> There's a similar pattern of thirst. <clears throat> and that's not surprising because, as I said, there's no volume deficit to sense differently, only the osmolar load. So they got just as thirsty, but when they were given free access to drink at the end, the older subjects drank half as much. 
as the younger subjects. And because their heads were in a PET scanner, they could look at areas of the brain that were stimulated during that period of time. There's a, period of, there's a portion of the brain called the anterior mid cingulate cortex. And as volume of water was taken in by both groups, the young subjects showed a lesser reduction in that area of the brain, showing that they had quicker satiety. They turned off their drive to drink, or sorry, the older people turned off their drive to drink much more quickly than the younger subjects. And that's why they drank half as much fluid. So not only thirst, but the opposite of thirst, satiety, seems to be different in the aging brain. So let me summarize this part of my talk by just saying that thirst is blunted in older subjects during and after exercise and heat stress induced dehydration but not saline infusion. Healthy older adults eventually restore all of their fluid losses. If not, we're back to that turn to ash scenario. So eventually, they get back to fluid balance. That fluid balance still comes back to zero. There may be less in and less out, but it always comes back to zero. It just takes them longer to get there. And that age effect appears to be progressive. That is, it gets worse and worse as we go from age 50 to age 100. But there really aren't any good longitudinal studies to confirm that. And that decline is highly variable. There are undoubtedly 90-year-olds who sense thirst just as well as 18-year-olds. But on a statistical basis, the majority of them show those declines. So I'm going to turn my attention now to talking a little bit about the consequences of dehydration in the elderly, especially in the context of a changing climate. So I said that free-living elderly individuals don't walk around in a frank state of dehydration day in and day out. So there's no need to worry about them unless there's some perturbation, unless there's some stress, unless they exercise unless they come in to a laboratory study and exercise in a heat chamber, or unless, as many elderly do, they stay in their homes during environmental heat waves with no air conditioning. So we've done a lot of work looking at aging and temperature regulation in the context of passive heat stress. If you go back and look at data from the 1995 Chicago heat wave, in early July in 1995, the ambient temperature during the day rose to and stayed somewhere between 35 and 40 degrees centigrade. That's between 95 and 108 or 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Nighttime temperatures didn't dip on those days much below 30 degrees either. And so there's this big peak in total deaths. So these are earlier dates that summer, and when you get to July 13th, there's this huge peak in what are called excess deaths. And then when temperatures came back down to still hot, but a normal summer temperature, those deaths leveled off again. So this top line are the total deaths. The number of those deaths that are attributable to heat stroke, which is what you might think might happen, is really very low. But the majority of those deaths are cardiovascular deaths. And we've spent the past 15 years or so studying the aging cardiovascular system, the heart and blood vessels in the skin, as they relate to the ability to tolerate and thermoregulate in a hot environment. And then all other causes has a small peak, but again, people die during heat waves 
who are predominantly over the age of 65, and some heat waves as much as 95% of the excess deaths during a heat wave occur in people over the age of 65. And they don't die of heat stroke, they don't die directly of dehydration, but they die of some cardiovascular cause. Myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, stroke. So the relative mortality risk for cardiovascular deaths increases on hot days. You can see here in men and in women, once you get on either side of what we consider comfortable, the cardiovascular risk increases. And it increases much more on the hot side in men and in women, but there's a lot of excess deaths in women when it gets cold as well. And there's a lag time of somewhere between zero and two days. That is, if you look at heat waves, for example, heat waves are defined as a sustained period of abnormally hot weather. People who die during heat waves don't die on the first day. They typically die somewhere on the second or third day. And lots of epidemiological data supports the idea that during heat waves, which are now increasing in frequency and increasing in severity. That's the outcome of global, global warming. Humans are tropical animals, so all the stuff you hear about global warming is when they talk about the average or the mean temperature on Earth increasing by two-tenths of a degree or three-tenths of a degree. The fact that the mean temperature is increasing really doesn't affect human health very much because as tropical animals, we adapt. The reason that global warming is a health problem, and especially a health problem for the elderly, is that global warming, as I said, increases the frequency of heat waves and increases the severity of heat waves. So in France, there were six heat waves from 1971 to 2003. The excess mortality, that is, the additional people who died above what history would predict would die within a given age group was somewhere up to almost 14,000 deaths. Heat waves killed more people nation worldwide than any other environmental disaster. More than Hurricane Katrina, more than tornadoes, more than floods, in fact more than most of those environmental disasters put together. Again, the mortality ratio increased with age once you get to about 55, and the greatest excess mortality was for cardiovascular disease. Sweden, similar data, increased risk of non-fatal myocardial infarcts increased when temperature is higher than the previous day. Italy, 3% increase in myocardial infarcts with an extra two hours of heat discomfort. All of these things, the key words are cardiovascular in nature. New York City, during heat waves, for every one degree increase in temperature, air temperature, cardiovascular hospital admissions, people showing up at New York City hospitals with cardiovascular complaints, increases one and a half to three and a half percent. So hot weather, sends older people to the hospital or kills lots of older people in excess of ones who would die normally without the hot weather. Why does that occur? Well, it occurs because when humans increase their body temperature, they have large increases, large and unique increases in blood flow to the skin. Humans regulate body temperature different than any other animal, including other primates in that we have this ability to pump huge amounts of blood flow to the skin to support heat loss when we're hot through convection and radiation and to provide fluid for sweating. In addition to pumping blood flow to the skin, we also decrease blood flow to areas that don't need it, the kidneys, the gut, the liver. And the way we get all this blood flow to the skin is by redistributing some of that blood flow, but mostly by increasing contractility of the left ventricle. The left ventricle has to work extremely hard 
under heat stress conditions to pump blood flow to the skin. And I'm not talking about exercise, where that also has to pump blood flow to working muscle. The left ventricle has to supply all of the energy needed when an individual is just lying there or sitting there in a hot room to pump all that blood flow to the skin. Humans can pump up to seven or eight liters per minute of blood flow to the skin at rest if they get really hot. And cardiac output, which is somewhere on the order of five liters per minute at rest under cool conditions, can double to do that. The problem with pumping all that blood flow to the skin is it's hard to get it back to the heart. Central blood volume decreases, which makes it even harder for the left ventricle to keep pumping blood flow to the skin for thermoregulation. The tie-in here with dehydration is this blood volume. The more fluid you can keep in the system, the easier it is to prime this pump and the less work the left ventricle has to do to keep pumping blood flow to the skin. We did a series of studies some years ago in our lab uh, where we brought in young individuals aged 19 to 28, and we tried to, and were successful I think, at simultaneously measuring lots of different aspects of this integrated cardiovascular response to heating. We put them in a water perfused suit, which is just a lycra suit with tubes sewn into it, and pumped really hot water through those tubes. And what happens is, as their body increases that heat storage, their core temperature starts to go up. It's one of the few ways you can get people's core temperature to go up without exercise. So this is just passive heating, much more similar to what would happen in a heat wave when an elderly 70-year-old woman who's nailed her window shut because she fears crime and has no air conditioning just stays in that hot room. So we measured cardiac output, we measured skin blood flow, we measured blood flow to the liver and the kidneys using dilution techniques, and what we saw was what Larry Rao had predicted years ago based on limited data, that in younger subjects, they increase their skin blood flow by almost six liters per minute, just lying there. Their cardiac output doubled, and they decreased blood flow to the gut, the liver, and the kidneys. We also did those same studies in a group of 64 to 81 year olds. In those subjects, skin blood flow, when you get older, doesn't increase nearly as much. Cardiac output doesn't go up as much, and that redistribution of flow to areas that don't need it doesn't occur as much. That's not necessarily a problem with respect to life and well-being. The same data that I just showed you, in the young subjects, <coughs> cardiac output goes up, in the older subjects, goes up very low. The heart rate goes up about the same in both groups, but remember in older people, any given heart rate is a higher percentage of their maximal heart rate. So that reflects more strain on the heart. Central venous pressure, which is a measure of blood coming back to the heart, went down in both groups. We had a pick line in these people, so we had a peripherally inserted cardiac catheter to actually measure directly central venous pressure. But here's the key. <coughs> In younger subjects, even though central venous pressure was falling, even though blood pressure was falling, they're able to increase the contractility of the left ventricle to maintain stroke volume. The older subjects aren't, and stroke volume falls. This tremendously increases the work on their left ventricle. So in these heating conditions, you have a scenario where even with healthy aging, the heart becomes less responsive to stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system and less able to increase its contractility. In a time when it's necessary to do that to be able to maintain your body temperature. That's why people have cardiovascular problems during heat waves over the age of 65. 
Again, we had this peripheral catheter that went right into the heart. <coughs> as, I, <coughs> excuse me, as I said, for any given level of central venous pressure, heart rate goes up the same in the old people, but it's a greater percentage of their maximal heart rate. So again, more strain. So what's that have to do with fluid intake? We repeated those studies. Here you see a, a water perfused suit and an older woman subject. In a smaller group of women aged 52 to 80, we passively heated them again. We heat them until they can't really tolerate it anymore. This is a really uncomfortable experimental scenario. And although their core temperatures only increase a degree or a degree and a half centigrade, it's really uncomfortable when you clamp skin temperature at a really high temperature. So in this set of studies, what we did was, in previous studies, those male subjects didn't have any fluid to drink while we were heating them up. In this set of studies, we had them drink a fixed portion of their body weight at three different time periods. And they drank either no fluid, water, or an unnamed carbohydrate electrolyte solution. <laughs> key here is Gatorade has sodium. We looked at the decrease in plasma volume, that is how much volume they lost during sweating that wasn't replaced by the fluid, and as you would expect, the greatest loss was when they didn't drink anything. But when they drank just water, that water didn't stay in the vascular space. So you still had a fairly large decrease in plasma volume. But when they drank something that had a solute load and had sodium in it, you can minimize that decrease in plasma volume. And when we looked at the stroke volume, it was 62 milliliters per beat with no fluid, 60 with water, but putting sodium into the system and having a hydration scenario that keeps fluid in the system allows them to have a high stroke volume and a high cardiac output and a lot less cardiovascular strain. So hydration doesn't directly result in cardiovascular deaths in the elderly during heat waves or during other types of stressful environmental situations, but it's an indirect cause in that it makes the cardiovascular strain worse. We can prevent some of these problems with heat acclimation, but here again, the elderly are at a disadvantage. When you go out on that first hot day and run around campus in the springtime and it's hot for the first time, you notice a lot of things that are different. You notice that you don't sweat very much. When you do sweat, it's usually on the torso and on the back and on the face. You can't go as far and your heart rate is higher. After heat acclimation, by the time summer's over, and you go out and do that same run around campus, it's much easier, you can go faster, lower heart rate, more sweating. The critical component of heat acclimation occurs on the first couple days, and that is we expand our plasma volume. We expand our plasma volume because we wash out proteins from the blood and then they return in the lymph, and because we have increased fluid intake. It doesn't do any good to sweat and not replace fluid if you want to expand plasma volume. So there have been two different studies directly to address this issue, one that we did, one that was done by a, a Japanese group. So our acclimation study involved four days. We had people come in, 24-year-old versus 67-year-old men. We had them exercise at a relatively moderate workload in a warm environment, and you can see that the younger subjects were able to expand their plasma volume and the older subjects weren't. And the reason that, that occurred is right after exercise, the younger subjects drank more than the older subjects. And then when we followed them over the next 24 hour period, the younger subjects continued to drink more because of that thirst drive that I talked about earlier. Older subjects, not as much. And if you don't put as much fluid back in, you certainly can't maintain or expand your plasma volume. Similar results in this Japanese study. 
So last thing I'll mention are other changes that go along with hydration and thirst in the elderly. Everybody knows that as we age, body composition changes. There's a decreased lean body mass. And when you decrease your lean body mass, you decrease your total body water. So from age 30 to age 70, total body water decreases by about 300, and so, 300 or so milliliters per year. Once you get past age 70, that accelerates. And so that your total body water, which comprises about 60% of your body weight to 55% in men and 45% in women as you go from age 20 to age 65. Why do we care about that with respect to hydration? If you have a lower body water to begin with and you lose a certain amount of fluid in sweat, diarrhea, vomiting if you're ill, that equal volume of fluid that you lose represents a more severe dehydration in the elderly who start off with less total body water to begin with. There are also changes in renal function that tie in. Renal blood flow goes down as we age. Glomerular filtration rate goes down. So the capacity for maintaining fluid is weaker as we get older. Even though the plasma antidiuretic hormone response is normal, the kidneys don't respond to that hormone as well. And so we did a study a while ago with young women and older women. You can see the age ranges here. The purpose, the primary purpose of this study was to look back when, uh, you're all too young to remember except for Chris Cole, that there was a big scare at one point uh, about ibuprofen use and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and not only their effects on the gut but the effects on hydration and their effects especially in people on a low sodium diet. So we took these young women and older women and we put them on the lowest sodium diet we could come up with. Our research clinicians came up with a diet that tasted just like cardboard. We had them come in every day and eat in our, our metabolic kitchen and so we were talking about diets as low as less than 10 milliequivalents per day. And they were either taking ibuprofen or a placebo. By day four, the young subjects, because now if you have low sodium, you don't want to lose sodium in the urine, the younger subjects were able to maintain sodium by decreasing sodium excretion in the urine. But the older subjects just kept pumping out sodium in spite of the fact that they weren't putting in sodium. Because they remained in negative sodium balance, the bigger problem was that water follows the sodium. So if you're peeing out a lot of sodium, you're going to be losing a lot of free water as well. So free water clearance was higher in the older group significantly than it was in the younger group. So it's kind of a double whammy. Losing more fluid, blunted thirst response, taking in less fluid. So older adults have an impaired ability to conserve sodium and water during sodium restriction. By the way, the drugs that we tested over the counter doses had no effect. So just to add to the previous summary, one more point and then I'll wrap it up. Low fluid intake along with age-related changes in renal function and body composition may increase vulnerability of the aged to these environmental extremes. And in a changing climate, we're going to have many more and many more severe environmental extremes. That creates a public health problem, even for the healthy elderly. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Any questions from the audience? Kevin? Yeah. Uh, just one question. What is, you know, going through all these uh, progressions of different figures and everything, the one thing that kind of stood out uh, to me was how is the lack of hypovolemic thirst related to uh, like a lower vascular compliance 
the the uh, normal occurring thirst involves increases in osmolality and decreases in blood volume. Those decreases in blood volume are sensed by primarily the low pressure baroreceptors, but high pressure baroreceptors as well. And so as we age and the vasculature changes in general, becomes more stiff, it's expansion, it's baroreflex sensing capabilities to send the same signal to the brain in response to a hypovolemic challenge decrease. dietary impact of sodium, especially in the elderly. Um, it's an interesting question because our sense of thirst as it relates to the amount of sodium in the system doesn't really change. And yet, at the renal excretion side of things, it does change. So for a given, soda, a given sodium load, older individuals tend to uh, stay in a, in a, in a an altered balance state, depending on whether it's more or less sodium, and then the water follows. The problem, of course, comes from the fact that so many individuals in general and so many individuals over the age of 65 are on low sodium diets, and some extremely low sodium diets. So it's a, it's, there's a, a lot of public health literature now with respect to salt-sensitive hypertension, how many people really need to be on sodium-restricted diets. And, uh, from the standpoint of a very active, healthy, older individual, they need to be taught that they do need to maintain probably higher than normal sodium intake to be able to have sodium and water balance as they maintain an active lifestyle. Let me ask a question. Um, I know many people argue that uh, most of the day-to-day -day fluid balance is dictated by uh, thirst driven primarily by mouth cues. Are you aware, aware of any data showing that those mouth cues or oropharyngeal receptors being altered by aging? Yeah, that's a great question. I, my first take on the data is that mouth cues are even less important than behavioral cues day-to-day but they kind of fine-tune the system. And so as your mouth gets drier, for example, that provides that oropharyngeal drive to drink. To my knowledge, there's no data showing an age-related change in oropharyngeal stimulation or oropharyngeal metering. Studies that have been done in younger exercising subjects, for example, where Instead of drinking fluid, you rinse out your mouth and then spit it out so you get that stimulation but not the fluid load. Haven't been done in older subjects. Be a great set of experiments to do. So, if there are no more questions, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Kenny for coming over, and uh, I would like to present you with a small uh, University of Arkansas uh, paperweight. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for coming and uh, there is lunch outside.